Hello. Well, fellows, members, and guests of the Royal Philatelic Society <coughs> London, wherever you may be, and I understand we have 21 uh, uh, countries today represented, all the way from Tasmania through Egypt to Hawaii, and back again, I hope, to a small place in uh, Cheshire, where our president is standing by to give us a uh, afternoon's entertainment. Now it's called Feet, Horses, Paddles, Wheels and Wings. Whichever one of those you'd like to take on board, I suggest you sit down and um, <laughs> don't do any of them for the moment because Richard, our president, is going to talk about the uh, development of postal services in Sudan from 1844 to 1928. Now that's quite a long time and he's going to do it in a little over half an hour. And we're all looking forward to that very much indeed. So thank you everybody for coming on board. And without further ado, I'm going to ask Richard to make his presentation. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Richard. Right, okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this presentation. Uh, we're looking at the development of postal communications and the presentation is divided into four main groups. The early mail and Egyptian territorial post offices. Richard? Richard yes? You're not showing your screen though. Oh, sorry. Wait a minute. We are waiting. Are you, am I showing that now? No. Am I showing it now? No. Oh dear. Alt and tab. Yes, to get to get from your presentation back. Into oh, wait the... a moment. I need to go across to the to the left. That's it, isn't it? Richard. Yes. Is that it? Richard, you need to click on the share screen button in Zoom. Okay. All right. Um, I'll have to do alt and tab again. Yeah. I, wait a moment. I can't get back to. Zoom, Zoom meeting, share screen, yeah. Share screen, and then within that dialogue, you need to choose your, your presentation yep. and then click on that share button, the, the, the blue and white share button. Green button. Green the button, green oh, no, button, no, get I you know. started. Okay, I've got yeah. the one. Is that it? Perfect. Okay, we're, sorry about that, folks. We're all um, with you now. Okay, we'll be looking at the four things listed on the screen, early mail, Egyptian territorial post offices, followed by the campaigns, and then what will be a quick look at river and railway traveling post offices and conclude with a few pioneer air mails. If you need to go use alt tab to get back to the presentation, Richard, so you can advance the slides. Alt and tab, yeah. Yeah, to get you back to the presentation. I'm on the PowerPoint slideshow presentation Fantastic. Now. Perfect, so you should be able to click and move forward a slide. Yes. You're, okay. You're cooking with gas now, you're on. Go for it. Yeah, I want to get rid of that gallery view that is at the side as well. Don't, well, don't worry about that. Okay. We, 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 we can all see your screen. Okay, thanks very much. We will start with early mail in 1846. I've got a couple of earlier items, but this is the more interesting one. It's a letter from John Errington, who was a miner, explorer and traveller who travelled in the Sudan for a period of two months, making notes of everything that he saw, the flora, the fauna, the people that he met, um, and the total situation that was going on at the time. And he wrote a very interesting letter um, when he got back to Wadi Halfa and posted it uh, when he returned to Egypt, because there were no mail services at all in the Sudan at the time. So you can see that it was sent via Malta, and also it was disinfected. Um, and there are slits on, on the back and on the front of this envelope. Moving on then, an inward item from 1857, which is part of the John Petherick uh, correspondence. This is a well-known correspondence, I think that dates from the 1970s uh, when it was first discovered. There are a number of covers in existence. And uh, he was the consul in Khartoum and all the mail had to be sent via Cairo 
Um, and you can we start to see the various spellings of the word Khartoum. It, as well as Chartoum, it's Khartoum and just Khartoum with the, that we will see later on. Moving on then a few years, and this is short, uh, one year before the uh, post offices, Egyptian territorial post offices were opened in the Sudan. And this is a privately carried letter from Kassala, uh, dated the 28th of June, 1866. And of course, there are no postal markings to it. Now, the first post offices opened at Masawa and Suakin in 1867 on the Red Sea coast, and they were shortly followed in the early 19, uh, 1870s by post offices at Wadi Halfa, Berber, Dongla, Kassala, and Khartoum. And there are two items here. The one on the left, an 1877 stamp list cover, which is an item of uh, consular mail sent uh, from the consulate Masawa to the Italian consul in Cairo. And the item at the right is later, uh, 1885, and it's a different type of uh, Masawa cancellation, cancelling the Egyptian one piastre stamp on this cover to Paris. Other interesting aspects of the territorial post offices were firstly, intaglio seal cancellations. These are really quite impressive. There are, they are known on cover, but they're quite rare. Um, I have them on the three illustrated there on stamps in my collection. So there's the first one from Masawa and then the two lower ones illustrated from Suakin and Gadarif. The items on the right are interpostal seals and they're particularly interesting because throughout the Ottoman Empire, they were used at the territorial post offices to seal packets of letters that were principally sent from the head post office to uh, subordinate offices, sometimes between subordinate post offices and occasionally from a post office to an individual. They were placed over the flap to seal the packet. Consequently, when the, the packet was opened, most of the seals were broken. So used items are much scarcer than the mint examples of which there are a lot on the market. And there are two for uh, Sudan illustrated there from Berber and Khartoum. They have not been recorded on complete covers coming from the Sudan, but they do exist uh, on covers from other territorial post offices in different locations. Moving then to 1874 and General, formerly Colonel Gordon, before he was promoted in 1882, um, is writing to Colonel Nugent shortly after his appointment as governor of the equatorial province of the Sudan, that being the most southerly province and a large remote area. Any mail from there had to be privately carried. And this is an eight page autograph letter from Gordon to Colonel Nugent in London. And he writes about his journey from Gondokoro on the Uganda border uh, up to Khartoum. And it took him only 11 days. And on his arrival, everybody was amazed that he made that journey in such a short period of time. He describes the activities of the hundreds of slavers that he was, whose uh, activities he was trying to, cont to curtail. Um, and all the other people that he met, get, met Gessie uh, and uh, other explorers in the Sudan at the time. And uh, a couple of light-hearted uh, comments. There can't be many people uh, who have been uh, kept awake at night by a hippopotamus. Also, uh, the loss of uh, his soap and his shaving brush was not something that uh, he could uh, easily replace or replace at all in remote areas uh, that he was currently working in. Similarly, another letter from Gordon, this time to General Stanton in Paris. It was charged six decimes on arrival. And the General Stanton is the father or was the father of Captain Edward Stanton, who designed the Camel Postman stamps for the Sudan. And you can see here that this, on the postmark illustration, there's the spelling of Khartoum is just Hartum. So there were four, three, four, five different spellings of, of the word Khartoum over a period of 20 to 30 years. 
He also went further into the Lado Enclave, that area of the Belgian Congo. Um, and this is a privately carried letter from him. And I think I said earlier that uh, although the Egyptian post offices were in the more populated and easily accessible parts of the Sudan in the central and northern part, one had to use runners, camels and private steamers uh, as the only methods of carrying mail from the remote areas. Uh, and there are a number of these covers around from Gordon, uh, several of them, I think, from the Lado Enclave. Another early item, this time through the territorial postal system, uh, from the explorer James Grant, who with Speak, as we know, explored the source of the Nile. And this is sent to Carl Giegler, who was director of tele uh, telegraphs in Khartoum at the time. Now, if we look at the date of the letter, the 19th of July, 1879, um, Grant talks about the development of a telegraph service between Cairo and Cape Town, and also his attendance at the funeral of the Prince Imperial of France, who was killed in action during the Zulu War of 1879. And that uh, funeral was held in Britain. It was attended by many of the, of the crowned heads of Europe, uh, some of whom stood in as uh, pallbearers, and there were thousands of people present. And uh, James Grant is very annoyed indeed because he is very upset that a road stole a valuable gold watch by picking, by picking his pocket at a funeral. He could expect that to happen perhaps at a race meeting, but not a scoundrel doing this at a, at a, a funeral. In this item, Carl Giegler is writing to Colonel Gordon, proposing a postal system for the Sudan. Now, unfortunately, this item is not dated. It is probably during the last few years of the 1870s. And in it, Carl Giegler describes what Cairo has to do to set up a postal system and then what the Sudan has to do. And these simple statements here did form the basis of the Sudan postal system that was subsequently introduced in 1897. Another letter from Colonel Gordon to Carl Giegler, this time in 1881. Uh, he's writing from London to Giegler Pasha, as he was known in Khartoum. And he writes about the Tufik Pasha, the eldest son of the Khedive, and Romulo Gessi and Slatin Pasha, who were two people that worked for Gordon during his uh, efforts to contain the slave trade uh, in the southern part of, of Sudan. Slatin Pasha, of course, it later became the governor of Darfur, and he was captured by the Mahdist forces and detained for 12 years in, in the prison in Omdurman and subsequently escaped in 1895. Moving on then to the Sudan campaigns of 84 to 98, we look quickly at the siege of Khartoum, then the Nile expedition, 84, 85. Operations also took place in the eastern part of the Sudan, around Suakin and Tokar on the Red Sea coast. After Gordon was killed, all the uh, troops were withdrawn with the exception of a garrison at Wadi Halfa, just inside the, Egypt, the, the border with Egypt, and another force at Suakin in order to contain the activities, or try to contain the activities of Uthman Digna, one of the Mahdi's uh, principal emirs. The Dongola expedition of 1896 was the opening movement of the reinvasion of the Sudan and the capture of Khartoum. Indian forces at that time were again deployed uh, around Suakin, and that was they were both the prelude of the Nile expedition of 1897-98. The map will illustrate firstly the Wadi Halfa to Kerma railway towards the left at the top of the map. Um, that Halfa Kerma railway, we'll see an, an example that was date stamped on that traveling post office, but it was only in, force for, in place for a few years and was um, 
closed down in, in 1904, the uh, desert railway running from Wadi Halfa to Berber was subsequently extended to Accra and then on to uh, Khartoum. And that was the railway that was used mostly during the 1897-98 reconquest campaign. Okay, we'll move then to the siege of Khartoum. This is an interesting letter, uh, cover and letter, um, sent by Major General Sir John Cowell, Master of the Royal Household, to General Gordon besieged in Khartoum in September 1884. It was written by Cowell at his uh, home, Clifton Castle near Beedale, and unfortunately the letter never arrived at Khartoum. It got as far as Asud on the Nile, and there was no means to carry it forward because that part of the Sudan was occupied by the Mahdist forces. So you can see that uh, it is endorsed in manuscript on the reverse, communication avec le Sudan in Toronto, and it was returned to Clifton Castle. Now, during the siege, Gordon, um, there are two stories really about this as to the purpose of his uh, visit or his being sent by the government to Khartoum. Firstly, that it was to assess the situation and then report back to the government. And the other theory is that it was also to uh, evacuate the Egyptian garrison. When Gordon got there, and he was not noted for obeying orders as strictly as he should, uh, putting it at its highest. And when he arrived, he found that as well as the garrison, there were thousands of civilians. And if he evacuated the garrison, the civilians would be killed. So the action he took was to fortify Khartoum, and the Mahdist forces laid siege to it. He created money during the siege, and that on the right of the screen is a 100 piastre note, uh, hand signed by Gordon. Some of, he produced 10 different denominations of notes uh, to a value that totaled around 168,000 pounds. And some of these were had hectograph signatures, uh, whilst others had um, those actually signed by Gordon. And of course, collectors who go for these things uh, want the ones that are actually signed by General Gordon. This is the letter that was in, inside the envelope. And you can see that it starts, my dear Charlie, both Cowell and Gordon had served in the Royal Engineers during the Crimean War, knew each other. And the note contained uh, good wishes from Her Majesty Queen Victoria, and whether the, he hoped that uh, the efforts of uh, Colonel Stuart and Frank Power to escape the siege uh, by, in the steamer Abbas uh, down the Nile uh, had been successful, but unfortunately, at the time the letter was written, they'd both been lured ashore and killed. Nile expedition was put in place as a result of intense pressure on the government of the day, led by Gladstone, to relieve Gordon in Khartoum. And there were no separate postal arrangements made. You had to, the soldiers relied upon the civilian post offices and introduced new ones where there was no post office at all. This is just an example of one of the uh, cancellations that was used on mail, the Corti Large Star and Crescent date stamp. Uh, it was at one time thought to be incredibly rare, but uh, they're scarce, but it, it's certainly not as rare as I think some have indicated in the past. Another uh, similar item, post office at Dongola. This is uh, a cover from Lieutenant Marling, who was awarded the Victoria Cross for saving the life of another soldier at the Battle of Tamei in March of 1884. And he sent writing to his, his father in, uh, in Gloucestershire. Ordinary date stamp with uh, the cancellation of a one piaster Egyptian stamp. Part of the, one of the interesting aspects of this uh, expedition is the introduction of overseas contingents. Anyone who thinks that um, multinational forces are a modern phenomenon needs to go back and look at this because there were British troops, Indian troops, Sudanese, 
Egyptian, plus the contingents from Canada and from New South Wales. We'll come on to each of them in turn. The Canadian contingent of voyageurs were largely boatmen. Lord Wolseley, who led the expedition, didn't wish to use the local boatmen because of the size and complexity of the operation that he had undertaken. And casting his mind back to the Red River Expedition of 1870 in Canada, arrangements were made for 360 Canadian voyageurs to come from Canada. Most of them were from uh, Ontario, uh, some from Manitoba. And they, considered, they consisted also of groups of First Nation Canadians from the Iroquois and the Mohawks. And this is a photograph of some of the uh, contingent outside the Ottawa Parliament building shortly before their departure for Egypt and the Sudan. The force was led by Lieutenant Colonel Dennison. Now, as far as mail from the contingent is concerned, if we look firstly at the item on the right, the one addressed to Surgeon Major Nielsen, he was the principal medical officer. And there are 19 covers recorded inward to the Sudan from Canada. They're all addressed to Surgeon Major Nielsen, and that's an example of one of them. There are five covers known from the contingent to Canada or other addresses. I think there are a couple of them, a couple of them go to the UK. Four of them are officers rate, and the one I've illustrated is the only item from a Canadian boatman, and that was formerly in the Danson collection in, in 1977. And then it reappeared again in, in 19, at an auction in 1993. It was countersigned correctly, but incorrectly taxed 10 cents, which was double the officer's rate. Well, so it should have been much lower on arrival in Winnipeg. In order to try and cut off the great bend in the Nile and to move across from Corti to Matema quite quickly, Wolseley created the Camel Corps and some of the caricaturists and cartoonists of the day uh, had a wonderful time with their drawings which were published in Punch, uh, Illustrated London News, Graphic and other journals. The idea of six foot six inch guardsmen being trained to ride a camel was, a, was, was a, something of considerable mirth and uh, this is a a drawing or an illustration that I particularly like um, of Wolseley leading his um, dash across the Bayuda Desert. Um, the idea there in one of the illustrations of a soldier in full Highland dress uh, playing the bagpipes while seated on a camel charging across the desert uh, is, is quite an imaginative thought. Um, there were four regiments, the heavy, light, mounted infantry and the guards camel regiments and the guards camel regiment had a small detachment of royal marines with it the names heavy and light has got obviously nothing to do with the size and weight of the camels on which these soldiers were mounted simply indicates that these soldiers were drawn from the heavy and light cavalry regiments of the british army and the note uh, that uh, from amelia edwards the victorian writer and traveler that the camel has his virtues, but they do not lie upon the surface. It's a very good illustration that of anyone who's ever tried to mount a camel and ride it. It's not the easiest task with which one might be faced. The cover is Frank with a penny red and a uh, penny uh, lilac unusually, and it, most of them were not stamped that came from sold from soldiers because they very quickly learned that uh, they weren't charged the rate at the other end. So if it was properly endorsed on active service, no stamps available. Word got round very quickly. This one, of course, um, had the penny lilac and it was uh, canceled on entry into the UK uh, with the foreign office uh, hand stamp. On the back as a dispatch mark is the Corti Large Star and Crescent uh, date stamp. Operations in the Eastern Sudan then, uh, Indian forces were sent and British forces. They had, the British forces and the Indians had their own postal service with them. However, the British Army Post Office didn't arrive until the 28th of March, 
1885, and the sol soldiers arrived probably around the second week in February. So the arrangement was that until the BAPO arrived, all mail had to go through the civilian post office of Suakin. And this is a cover uh, cancelled in such a way, and it's part of the Sandbatch correspondence. Brief word here because we've seen more Sandbatch items. There were two brothers, Captain Henry Martin and Lieutenant Arthur Edmund. Uh, Arthur Edmund was the youngest. In, in fact, there was an elder brother to the two of them who didn't go into the army, went into the church. But uh, Henry and Arthur both served in different regiments in the, during the operations in the Eastern Sudan in 1885. Um, Arthur Edmund appears again in 1897-98. Captain Henry Sandbach was killed whilst hunting lion in Somaliland in 1895. So there's a letter there with the uh, cover from Sandbag Camp. This correspondence consisting of three suitcases with the covers with the letters inside in rows all on end was came on or came onto the market in the late 1980s the family had two houses one at Hafadunos near Abergelly and another one at uh, Bringwin near Oswestry and at the house in Oswestry in the late 1980s a postcard dealer was called in and he was asked the question would anybody be interested in all these envelopes and letters some of the letters that had family items written ab about them in the letters themselves were removed and photocopies were included with the covers. And all the family correspondence went to the county archivist. The postcard dealer called in Stephen Murray, um, who we used to see at the, the, who we see at the York stamp fair very often. Um, and he, with another dealer, went through the correspondence and it, they purchased it. If the postcard dealer hadn't called them in, then the whole lot could have ended up in a skip. And it is one of the most magnificent military correspondences ever to come on the market. Again, with operations in Eastern Sudan, this cover to uh, Mrs. Edwards uh, about her son who was mortally wounded at the Battle of Tofrek in March 1885. Um, and that was sent via the Indian Field Post Office and the British Army Post Office. I mentioned very briefly the New South Wales contingent. The government of New South Wales volunteered to send a battery of artillery and a battalion of infantry, and that was gratefully accepted by the British government. There are seven covers from the contingent known, uh, sent from the Sudan, uh, to mostly addresses in Australia. This one uh, goes to New Zealand and only two of them, and this is one of them, that has the letter with it. There are no items recorded going from Australia to the contingent. Um, they only spent seven weeks in the Sudan um, and the unit was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Nicholson. Further items in operations in Eastern Sudan. Um, I mentioned that uh, Indian forces mail should go through the Indian Field Post Office and the British forces mail through um, the British Army Post Office. There were exceptions to this as inevitably is the case. But this one, the one on the left, this was deliberate. There was a small detachment of commissariat and transport um, soldiers, probably 15 or 16 of them who were attached to the British Army, and they were allowed to use the Nine Pi uh, Indian Soldiers and Seamen's envelopes and post them through the British Army Post Office. And this is the, this is the only one that uh, I've ever seen. The one on the left, uh, Surgeon Johnston, uh, item through the British Army Post Office to the Orkney Islands. I also have an inward uh, cover to him, which uh, was sent in, went in through the Indian Field Post Office. So I think in some instances, whichever post office was the most convenient was the one that the soldiers used for was, ha was handling incoming mail. 
Item on the top right is a Turkish postcard from uh, Smyrna. Civilian mail should have gone through the civilian um, post office, but it didn't. It went through the Indian field post office and it was redirected from Surkin to Cairo. So it's got the Indian FPO mark as an arrival and a dispatch date stamp. The item at the lower left is entirely correct. Um, Indian item correctly franked, stamped, and with the uh, Indian FPO dispatch date stamp on the reverse. Again, a sandbatch item. This is from one campaign to another, from the Warren Expedition, part of the Betuana Field Force, to Lieutenant Arthur Edmund Sandbatch. And a very interesting letter inside where it talks about uh, operations taking place in Southern Africa. And again, this question of the telegraph service being uh, introduced between uh, Cape Town and Cairo. And note that the letter is addressed or starts with the opening address, Dear Minimus. I mentioned there were three Sandbach brothers. They were all educated at Eton. So the eldest would be Sandbach Major, then Sandbach Minor, and the youngest, Arthur Sandbach Minimus. On the conclusion of, uh, after Gordon was uh, killed, I mentioned that uh, all, most of the forces were withdrawn, uh, but there were frontier forces kept around Surakin and also uh, one at Wadi Halfa. Um, this is an item that was offered to me by one of the dealers who bought the Sandbach correspondence. And I said to him when he showed me the, the cover, um, I'm really only interested in um, the Sudanese ones, not so much in the Egyptian ones. And his comment to me was, have a look inside at the letter. And it contains a description, short description of the defeat of the Mahdist forces at Toski in 1889. March 1889, when they tried to get into Egypt and they were decisively defeated. And the letter is signed H.H. H. Kitchener, uh, who commanded the cavalry at the battle. Needless to say, um, I purchased it. Very else, little else was um, occurred during the occupation and until the Dongola expedition of 1896, which was the prelude to the reconquest. Uh, the public of the day thought that, well, th this is to do with uh, avenging Gordon, but to a large extent, it was connected very much with the scramble for Africa by the European powers. And the British government wanted to get in first before the French did. And this largely, um, encourage them to mount the expedition. And the opening move of the campaign was the capture of Dongla on the Great Bend of the Nile. So there were Egyptian, so, uh, Egyptian troops uh, with uh, British officers. And there are a couple of items here showing Egyptian stamps camp uh, with the uh, Wadi Halfa camp date stamp. The Sloggett cover on the, on the right, uh, Arthur Sloggett was very good at creating covers. Some of them were hopelessly overfranked, and but with brilliant cancellation. So they were very much contrived and um, sending them home. There, there are some that have more of a commercial appearance about them. I think this one on the right is such a cover. Um, and anything sent by him, of course, is known as a sloggit cover. Indian forces were again sent to Surakin in 1896 and on arrival of a brigade group from India, a strong detachment was sent along the coast to hold the fort at Tokar. All the mail from the Indian forces in Surakin went through the base army post office and an item illustrated on the left there. The force at Tokar used the number one field PO uh, duplex, the date stamp to postmark their uh, Indian soldiers and sail the sailors' envelopes. The rate had been increased to one anna, which meant that the image on the uh, covers was overprinted with that value, one anna. 
there are uh, there is, I think, one item of inter-unit mail between Tokar and Surakin in existence. First issue stamps, the overprinted Egyptian um, items were used on mail sent by soldiers. Again, in the Nile expedition of 1897-98, there was no specific British Army post office with the soldiers to handle their mail. They used the uh, ordinary, well, I say ordinary, but the civilian post offices uh, that were available at the time. Date stamps were introduced as they went along. The one at Berber, I think, was a gradual effort to try and uh, produce a date stamp that actually had a date in it. To begin with, with mail at Berber, it received the manuscript cancellation on the form at the left. Um, and then subsequently, they used an undated um, canceller. And then there was a third type introduced uh, a few months later. An incident occurred shortly after the Battle of Atwa on the 8th of April, 1898, when a bag of mail um, was dropped in the Nile. It was retrieved, the mail was dried out, and every item, and there are 16 items recorded, received that cachet wet through collision on the Nile. At the time, there was only one brigade of British troops in there, uh, in the Sudan at the time, so all the covers emanate from either the Royal Warwick's, as this item uh, displayed is from, uh, or the Lincolnshire Regiment, the Seaforths, or the Cameron Highlanders. This is another item um, where the cover is one that most postal historians wouldn't think it was worth keeping in the collection. It's got a pen cancellation uh, across the stamp as well as a, a date a, a date stamp that's not very really clear at all. Again, Sandbatch correspondence, Arthur Edmund had been promoted to major at this time. And in it is a 12 page letter describing the reconnaissance in force of the Mardis camp by uh, a cavalry detachment um, in which Douglas Haig was involved and he has signed the letter. So the letter brings the whole thing alive. Further sandbatch item, this time 20th of August, 1898, 12 days away from uh, the Battle of Omdurman. He's on the gunboat El Hafa uh, and is writing home to his mother. An illustration of the, of the Hafa gunboat and then the other cover, um, I included that because it's the only late fee item I've seen inward to the Sudan. Um, and uh, I think it's reasonably uncommon. After the uh, fall of Khartoum, the Houses of Parliament passed a vote of thanks, both of them, to Kitchener, thanking him and Wingate for the work that they had undertaken in the success of the expedition. And this is the letter that Kitchener sent to Wingate, conveying that vote of thanks passed by both Houses of Parliament. We then move in, and we'll come back to them a bit late, a little bit later, the travelling post offices. The Halfa Halfire was quite a, a long distance because Halfire, subsequently, the name was changed in 1904 to Khartoum North. So the distance from Wadi Halfa was virtually up to Khartoum with a postmark Halfaya. It's addressed to Master Malcolm Wingate, second son of uh, Sir Francis Reginald Wingate, who was Governor General of the Sudan in the early part of the uh, 20th century. And he was decorated three times for bravery during World War I. He went out with the BEF in 1914 and was at most of the major engagements on, on the Western Front, but was killed in action on the 21st of March, 1918. I mentioned earlier the Gordon item sent from the Lado Enclave. Mail continued to be sent from the Lado Enclave uh, because the Belgian government found that it was, or King Leopold, it was an easy way of facilitating 
the transport of Congo, Congo uh, produce by taking it straight up the Nile through through to Car through Khartoum. There was a dispute between the Belgian and British governments from time to time during the first decade of the 20th century, and each government closed the Nile route at various stages. The item on the left is a standard White Nile TPO cover uh, with the up rating for the postage uh, to cover the distance through the Sudan. Uh, the one on the right uh, puzzled me for a, a while until uh, somebody suggested I should send it to Patrick Maselis, which I did. And he came back and said that it went via the Nile route because although the Belgian government had closed the, or the Nile route was closed at the time, somebody, the sender of the postcard, wanted to see whether he could get it through even when the route was supposed to be closed. Because sending it from Matadi, the easiest way would be the 20 miles to the, to the coast, and then it should go uh, up the Atlantic to, uh, to Paris. Further item from Don de Coro, Uganda post office in the Sudan. Uh, this is uh, endorsed, it's from Gondokoro, via, endorsed via Mombasa, which means it should have gone out to the eastern coast. It didn't. It went north via uh, Khartoum. And then it was uh, redirected. And when I read the redirection, I thought, oh, this is uh, fairly close to, to home, to uh, the location of the regional meetings that are held by the northwest region of the society because the card was redirected to Dunham House, Charcoal Road, Bowden. And uh, in the Northwest, we hold our regional meetings at the Mercury Hotel in Bowden, about a mile away from where this uh, item ended up. Moving on then to TPOs, the Shalal Halfa Travelling Post was the principal means of entry via the river for a considerable period of time cancellations are known going back to 1889. Um, it's a distance the TPO covered was 210 miles of which 207 miles are in Egypt and three miles are in the Sudan. This cover is one of the earlier ones uh, stated 1893 and the C-H-A-L-L -L rather than S-H-E-L-L -L spelling for Shalal. Wadi Halfa. The map indicates the railway and the river travelling post offices. We're going to be looking at one or two of the river TPOs, the early ones during the period up to about 1910-1912, and a couple of the major railway ones. So the Shalal Halfa TPO, uh, a late, later uh, cancellation, this one 1904, the travelling post operated between Kerma and Meroe, and it had its own cancellations, but it wasn't in use for very long, uh, only from 1903 to 1906. The railway TPOs, there were numerous ones. The Northern Railway System, the principal one was the Halfa Khartoum, but there were intermediate ones and local TPOs. The one on the left is the Khartoum Apra TPO of the main line. There were two TPOs, A and B. Presumably one went in one direction and the other went in the reverse direction. And a, uh, a postcard of the Sudan Desert Mail leaving Apra for Khartoum. The military railway, which I've mentioned a little bit earlier, um, the line was completed by the railway battalion in 1897. Um, and apart from the Dongola campaign, it was seldom used and was abandoned at the end of 1904. So cancellations from the Halfa Kerma TPO are, don't appear that frequently. I mentioned the Halfa Khartoum TPO, um, because of the uh, high passenger traffic and the um, amount of mail that was carried, some TPOs operated as little more than sorting off it, moving sorting offices, but others stopped at defined stations to carry out a wide range of postal business, and the Halfa Khartoum TPO was one of them. But there was a restriction that at stations where there was a post office in the same town, any correspondence 
uh, posted in the box on the mail train had to carry the late fee. And if it didn't, um, then it was uh, surcharged with postage due payable at the other end, doubled it if the 5 million rate. And there's a postcard there with the postage due on it and uh, a nice strike of the late fee not paid. Um, the Halfa Khartoum Intermediate is one which is, several collectors have tried to research it, but there's not much information about it. It is believed that it was used on the mixed freight and passenger trains bi-weekly between the running of the uh, express trains. Moving then from um, the Halfa Khartoum over to the Port Sudan Khartoum uh, branch line, this was a heavily used TPO as well. So it's not what we would call necessarily a branch line in the UK. Um, it consists of total distance 492 miles and combined what was previously the APRA Port Sudan TPO with the southern part of the main line. And the first cancellations were named Port Sudan Khartoum and then later uh, it was changed to Khartoum Port Sudan. And there were number one and number two uh, TPOs running in, in both directions. Moving on to the last section, then wings over the Sudan. Um, in 1914, or 19, back end of 1913, Mark Pop, who was an officer in the French army and serving at the time in what was then Indochina, he persuaded the Egyptian government to allow him to carry out a trial flight between Cairo and Khartoum. Mail bearing that large cogwheel type cachet was applied to all the envelopes uh, carried from Cairo to Khartoum and in the reverse direction a few, a few uh, days later. When Porp arrived at Khartoum. There were thousands of people to greet him. Um, and I think he stayed there for several days and then undertook the return flight. Mail again was loaded onto it, onto the plane. Um, and all of it had that particular cachet. This item uh, included, was addressed to the Viscount Kitchener of Khartoum, who was British agent in Cairo at the time. And it contained a letter from the Governor General of the Sudan, uh, Sir Francis Reginald Wingate. He says, my dear Field Marshal, he hopes that uh, Monsieur Pork will be as successful in delivering the letter as he was in bringing uh, to Wingate Kitchener's letter. There are no other postal markings. Now, there it was carried, but there are other covers around which have the cachet which were not carried. So they were merely received the cachet by favor. Nothing else took place in, as far as flights were concerned until Sir Alan Cobham's survey, Imperial Airways survey flight in 1925 to 26. Flight Magazine provided him with a, a large number of these um, postcards, which he signed and posted at different stages along the route. And that each of them had either that uh, rather nice vignette added to it, the green one, or there, there is uh, an orange uh, version as well, that quite nice um, Art Deco design on it. This particular item is a good illustration of the first small camel postman stamps that were introduced in 1921, because, because this was posted in 1926, uh, it must be that first one, uh, first issue, because the uh, watermark was changed to the letters SG from the uh, Egyptian Star and Crescent in 1927. In, 19, in 1927, Captain Gladstone undertook um, a series of flights from Khartoum to Kisumu and back. The first flight he tried with a de Havilland DH-50 
but on a trial flight before he departed on the journey itself, he hit a submerged object and the plane had to be sent back to the Blackburn Aeroplane Works in Greece for repair. And in jumped the RAF and lent him uh, a Fairy 3D, which he had fitted with floats. And as they say in the textbooks, off he went. Uh, some mail was carried on the first flight, uh, the first southward flight and on the return flight. Um, it, there was a second flight. No mail was carried on that. And this cover relates to the third flight. He was down at Kisumu on Lake Victoria and about to take off on the third northward flight. There are photographs, I've got a whole series of about 10 or a dozen photographs, original ones that were taken at the time of him before the flight, after the crash, the mail being dried out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he tried four times to get off from the lake. On the fourth occasion, the plane sank in 10 feet of water. What do you do? Well, it's East Africa, it's 1927, you improvise. A crane was brought up and hooked up onto the plane, at, the plane was dragged from the lake, probably doing more damage than when it hit the water in the first place. The mail um, was retrieved. All mail ha was hand stamped with a cachet and it was dried out on the lake site by the postal staff at Kisumu. And this is the photograph of the mail after being removed from the lake. You can see the postmaster there, uh, standing on one leg, leaning up against the cart, cigarette in mouth, pith helmet on head, holding his pet monkey. So clearly he's supervising all the postal staff who are on their hands and knees, laying out all the items, drying them on sacks. And the very last flight, it's a bit later than originally advertised, 1937, the first flight from Brisbane to Cape Town by Laurie Bonney. Laurie Bonney was uh, a pioneer Australian aviator. And when she got married, she decided not to, she wasn't flying at the time, but um, wasn't a pilot at the time. But when she got married, she decided not to get involved in her husband's um, manufacturing business. And she decided to take up flying. And she had, uh, Hinkler uh, teach her how to fly and she was became the first woman to circumnavigate Australia in an aeroplane. She then flew from Australia to England and when she was off on her pioneering flights uh, she would leave her husband with sufficient menus so that he could cook his own meals while she was away. Another story which is probably apocryphal is that she used to dry her washing in the slipstream of her aeroplane. And I say it's probably apocryphal because we're not told how she managed to retrieve the washing before she landed the plane. When she undertook uh, this flight from Brisbane to Cape Town, she encountered very bad weather at a number of locations, in particular in Iraq and coming down through the Sudan. As she came in, I think to land at Malakau. The plane was caught in a downdraft, hit the ground and tore out the metal tail skid. And fortunately there was a detachment of, again, of the RAF on hand, who manhandled the plane to uh, the bank and it was hooked up behind, or put on a barge, hooked up behind um, the usual Khartoum steamer and off she went back to uh, Khartoum. She did complete the journey to um, South Africa, to Cape Town, and in 181 hours flying time, she traveled 18,100 miles. She had christened her plane, which was a German Clem monoplane, My Little Ship 2, because it was the second aeroplane she had had. But the description that I read on one occasion is worth reading just to conclude today's presentation says that with the arrival of the regular paddle steamer, Mrs. Bonney took passage to Khartoum. As the boat set out, its deck was crammed with boxes and baskets of vegetables, fruit, poultry, cattle, noisy passengers and yelling crewmen. 
like a great floating market chugging down the river to Khartoum and swinging at the stern under the receding umbrella of black smoke from the steamer's tail funnel followed the flat top barge carrying the solitary aircraft. After a colorful five days, they arrived at Khartoum and there willing RAF mechanics repaired my little ship too. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for your attention. That concludes the presentation. Thank you, Richard. I've now unmuted Mr. Coburn. Um, I, hope, well, I hope I have, uh, Peter, because it's back to you. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think I'm um, live, as they say. Unlike you are, Peter. Unlike a number of those uh, people who were uh, uh, fighting the, the colonial wars or building the colonial railways or indeed delivering the mail all across the then empire. Richard, that was a, a highly illuminating and interesting talk, and I'm absolutely sure that every one of us has enjoyed it immensely. Uh, I would just like to mention that the slits on the envelope of John Errington's, the naturalist's um, letter that you showed fairly early on in your display, I just wondered whether with slits in envelopes and the problems of the pandemic these days, how many philatelists are already making a collection of uh, mail associated with this extraordinary time that we live in. Anyway, enough of me. It's time now for questions. And if anyone has questions, would they please put them onto the uh, chat? And uh, Mark Bailey will uh, uh, elucidate what is written and pass them on to our speaker. Yes, thank you, Peter. Uh, for, just to clarify for everybody, if you want to raise a question, please use the chat facility. The chat facility, if you put your mouse pointer over your um, Zoom window, then the controls appear at the bottom, and one of them is labelled chat. If you click on that, you can then type your question into the chat box. And uh, if you choose to send that to everyone, we'll all get to read it. So that's how we're doing the questions. Um, We've already had one question, which was, let me just find it. Richard, the question is, let me just see who this was from. This was from Grace. Richard, she says, uh, she sees it's not easy, but have you ever tried to ride a camel? Yes. And? Um, there were two buckets, one for me to sit in on one side of the camel and the other one for Jenny to sit in. The animal was on the, on the ground. As I got into the bucket, it stood up. Uh, the man in charge of it encouraged it to resume its position on the ground, which it did. But when Jenny got into the bucket, it got up again and she nearly ended up on the floor. <laughs> so it is, as some as one person described it to me, on one occasion, a contumacious beast. Ah, that's a good word. Anyway, away from beasts, back on to items relate, uh, matters relating to postal history. Robert, uh, Robert Martin asks, what does LNA on that uh, cancellation of Mark, uh, Mark Porpra on, on, his, uh, on his mail, what does LNA stand for? You know the um, yeah, that cogwheel thing. Yes, it's the initials of the aeroplane of an aeroplane company, Liney. I only know I can't remember the second two words. Okay, but it's Liney L L I G N E. It's in the textbooks, but that doesn't help. When I say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, I can't be more helpful on that one. Right. Um, Philippe and Thomas Lindikens are asking, how many covers are there from the Sam Batch archives? Ooh. Hundreds. Lit there are hundreds, probably into the thousands, I would think. Right. Okay. Because originally there were three, three s suitcases, probably two foot by two foot. Okay. And they were all in 
rows on end. So you'd get quite a lot in there. Um, yeah. yeah some of them were sold in batches. The, the better ones from well-known people, the Hay Kitchener and, and ones like that, those that describe battles are the most popular. Um, but sometimes others are sent in batches because after both of them served in India. Um, there's covers from Burma, the Northwest Frontier, the Sikkim expedition, uh, Hazara Field Force, Afghanistan, and then Arthur served again in India after the um, the, the Anglo Boer War and the Great War. He ended up as a as a major general. Right, right. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so. Uh, John Copeland would like has asked the question: How close were the links between the Egyptian and Sudanese post offices in the early twentieth century? The the links were were quite close. They were run as independent. As soon as the Sudanese one was set up, they were run as independent um, postal services. Um, and on the TPOs, certain concessions were allowed by the Egyptians, which the Sudanese didn't allow. Um, so it wasn't as straightforward uh, an arrangement as one might think it would be or should be. But um, with the TPOs in particular and the Shalal Halfa, it's still an area of uncertainty. We can't establish 100% which were the Sudanese and which were the uh, Egyptian TPOs. We We've got it down to a classification, but there may be one or two errors in there, and some of the textbooks are wrong. I mean, Proud talked about the cartoon Dongola TPO, but it doesn't exist. Um, it was the Karima Dongola TPO, just because it was K to KD something um, mm -hmm. on the cancellation. So, you know, you some records are not as reliable as they might be and you know people have guessed it when in fact they should say we think so and so but you know further research is needed yeah okay uh just before we move on to other um matters relating to uh analysis of stamps and so on richard moss is intrigued by the font that you use he says can you tell him the name of the font because it comes out uh, three-dimensional on his ipad so this is the, the script one with early mail yeah, no, i've used on early mail that's what it that's matura mt script capitals matura mt script capitals okay thank you right so uh frank walton would like to know was the Stanton that you referred to related to J.B.M. Stanton, who wrote the book on the detailed analysis of G.B. Penny Reds in 1958? Probably. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I think the, All right. I, the reason I say that is, mm -hmm. um, the other question I'm usually asked, apart from the which font I used, I use is Francis Wingate is he related was he related to Ord Wingate in World War Two? the answer is yes he was a distant cousin so I've already provided the answer if anybody's thinking of asking that's, that that's, one that's the Wingate but one, the but Stantons yes. there yeah. are I've I've been in correspondence with descendants of the Stantons about the camel postman stamps um, so it's quite a wide family there are two male descendants alive at the moment who have been interested in Edward Stanton who designed the Camel Postman stamp so there may well be others and what I've found is a lot of these links you can get some information that's worth investigating just by googling the name so I would say probably he is related mm -hmm. okay good thank you um just picking up on that LNA thing, uh, we've had a couple of people have suggested um, Nicola uh, Nicola Berdiat is saying that it was 
Ligue Nationale Ariane, and some and Mike Roberts says it's Lean Nationale Ariane. So that's the name of the airline, then presumably Lean. Yes. Yes. I yes Lean uh, L I N L I G L I G N E National yes. Ariane. The National Ariane is definitely right. I'd forgotten what that stood for. Okay. <coughs> right. Um, Bill Barclay says he's intrigued by your uh, Sawakin covers. He has a postcard with a Sawakin cancel, which he says is proud type D4, which was dated 1901, with the month shown as AO. He asks, do you think that this is forged? He thought that the French abbreviations were not used in Sudan. Oh, they were, yes. They were used. They were used in, 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 in the other thing that I found is that they, not just in remote areas, but in some of the major post offices, that they used whatever type was available that was as close to what they wanted if they didn't have exactly what, what they wanted. So you do get AO and there are other combinations I, I've seen as well. Um, you get things that movable type that is put in upside down letters are reversed um the first letter is left off so 1904 you see 904 quite often so yeah. there are variations in the movable type um and uh, i i i haven't seen one of the of the examples that he's mentioned but uh i i I'm not surprised that it does happen. Mm -hmm. okay. AO is used uh, quite frequently. Right. Well, thank you for that. Um, at the moment, that's the final question that we've had. So unless we get another couple of questions very soon, I think, Peter, we can say that we've had all the questions, in which case I would like to hand back to you. Thank you very much, Mark. And thank you, uh, Richard, for um, some very il illuminating answers. It reminds me of that extraordinary program that we have here in the UK, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And um, I wonder sometimes, some of the questions that are only worth 2,000 pounds are almost impossible to answer. Um, I think Frank's uh, was at least a, a 500,000 pound question about Mr. Stanton. Um, anyway, here we go. Um, after the uh, question and answer session then, it's time for me to uh, in in invite uh, Yvonne Weekly who has very kindly agreed to um, give a vote of thanks to our president. So Yvonne, uh, I hope you're there and it's over to you. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, fellows, members and guests. When our president gives the display, we know that we're in for something special. We've um, seen the historical political and the social events um, of Sudan during this period. And they've all been extremely well illustrated and explained by Richard. We started off with the early letters and the, and the, the two letters that I noted particularly were the ones uh, with the telegraph service and setting up the postal system. And then there was the, uh, uh, the letter from James Grant. And he was so indignant that he lost his gold watch, but I think he was even more indignant that it should happen at a funeral. We then moved on to the campaign mail and we saw letters from Haig, Gordon, Kitchener, Wingate, and then a, a number of uh, items from Sambek correspondents, all explaining the, uh, the military campaigns. We then went on and uh, if there'd just been uh, a few of those letters from those notable people, it would have been remarkable, but you've shown them in abundance. Then there was the uh, traveling post offices, both on water and on the land. And then finally, 
with the uh, Pioneer uh, flights. And I was very pleased to see uh, Laurie uh, Bonney was mentioned. Uh, certainly she did really pioneer flights and remarkable at the time. But there's one letter you didn't show. And that was the letter from Mr. Bonney with his reactions to being left with a pile of menus. I would like to take this opportunity of thanking you, Richard, for the way you've been leading the society through these very difficult times. Your presidential letter last week was just full of good news and all the things which the council uh, and you are doing together with the staff and the volunteers to restore all the services that we have at the Royal. And I know you're working very hard to make sure that we can return safely to uh, our meetings as soon as possible. And I'd like to uh, uh, give you all a sincere thanks for that. There's also some further good news that, that um, the um, Sorry. That <laughs> um, Harry's bar is uh, is open now. Well, that's if you can believe everything that you read in the newspapers, because the Daily Telegraph has a cartoon which features city bankers, and on Tuesday, two of the characters were arranging to meet at Harry's bar. So therefore, it must be open. And uh, finally, I would like to um, thank Richard for giving us such an interesting and extremely comprehensive um, display this afternoon, which we've all thoroughly enjoyed. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Yvonne, for your very kind and generous words. They, I appreciate them so much. Thank you very much indeed. Richard, well deserved. And thank you, thank you. Um, Yvonne, very much indeed for, for that uh, vote of thanks. And also, uh, may I thank you on behalf of the, 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 the council um, for those kind words about how we are trying to keep the show on the road. It's much appreciated. Yes. Now, um, there are a couple of things I'd like to draw your attention to, ladies and gentlemen, all across the world, because now we are in the virtual philately area. There are two items which I think are worth just mentioning, if uh, uh, our speaker doesn't mind. Um, sure. First of all, we have the Summer of Stamps. This has been called the Glastonbury of Philately, and it's being run by Matt Hill um, of, uh, of the uh, Stamp magazine. And if you go to www.allaboutstamps.co.uk, you will find right now a pretty large and interesting and almost comprehensive um, accumulation of websites for uh, philatelists to uh, buy things, sell things, talk about things and listen to things. And I'm sure that um, the amount of work that's gone into that is it very much um, uh, requires our attention. Secondly, uh, many of you will know that the London Stamp X of uh, October, uh, September, October this year has been canceled in uh, physical form, but it's coming online on October the 1st for 72 hours, non-stop virtual Stamp X. And your society, the Royal Philatelic Society London, is a partner in this um, operation. There are going to be um, a wonderful array of things to do. You can visit the site, you can go round the stands as it were if you were there, 
You can listen to um, hour-long lectures, uh, or even shorter, uh, if you're lucky. And uh, you can, um, apart from buying a cup of coffee, which you'll have to do yourself, you can have a complete philatelic summer experience at Stampex. So I would like to draw your attention to those. Um, from our point of view, we will be putting on a number of, um, we're, we've, we've, we've got a stand, we're partners, and we're putting on a show with the experts and uh, books for sale and lots of other interesting things. So as that comes on board, please sign up for virtual Stampex. I'm sure you can Google that, unless you're in China, in which case you'll have to TikTok it. Now, finally, all I need to say, I think, is to announce the next meeting, which is by Phil Ward. And he's going to talk about aspects of the Great Britain Queen Victoria Jubilee issue. And um, Phil is secretary of the um, Great Britain Philatelic Society. So I think he knows what he's talking about. And it is for your delectation in a fortnight's time on July the 30th. But please note, that in order to accommodate some of you living a very long way away in places like um, Fiji, I imagine, and Hawaii and, um, and uh, 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 New Zealand and places like that, we are going to make the time 3 p.m. That's an hour later than today. So 3 p.m. British summer time. Uh, and for those of you pedants who want to know, it's 2 p.m. Uh, Greenwich Mean Time. So we look forward to seeing you all again then, and Phil will be there to give us a very, very good talk, I have no doubt. So all of you GB buffs, come along and see the Jubilee issue on July the 30th. Do you know, I think that's all I have to say, apart from the fact of once again, thanking all of you, every single one of you, for giving the time and coming along, and we really hope you've enjoyed yourself. Richard, our president, thank you very much indeed for your time. Mark Bailey, thank you for organizing the IT, along with, uh, um, uh, not Colin Hoffman, but Mike Hoffman, his erstwhile son, and all of you who have put time in with the rehearsals and other things. And thank you, Yvonne, too, for your very, very nice talk. So God bless you all. And let's meet again in a fortnight's time. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank Peter. you very much, Peter. Peter, and everybody. What, what I would like to mention, if I may, is P Peter mentioned the virtual stamp X in October. One of the things that we will be doing with that is we'll be doing uh, the ability for people to chat to people at the Royal. You understand through uh, through a chat, um, a textual chat facility. And it'd be really nice, given that it runs for 72 hours continuously, it'd be really nice if we could have some of our members from around the world being involved with that so that when people are looking at it at whatever time zone they, they happen to be, that there's somebody on the end of that chat that's in the similar time zone that they can, they can chat to them. You know, we wouldn't want to find that, for example, somebody in Australia was trying to chat to us and, and, and all of us Brits were asleep or vice versa. So you see my point. We, and I picked that as an example. So, we, are, we will be very grateful for any of our members to volunteer to spend a bit of time being on the chat so that when people are chatting, they've got someone to chat with. Um, Peter uh, is an obvious person to share that information with, as is Chris King. Chris is actually our coordinator for the virtual Stampex, and Chris would be delighted to receive a note from you saying, yes, I'm, I'm prepared to... Uh, put in a bit of time uh, to be on the end of the chat. Um, Chris can be contacted at kingc at rpsl.org.uk. Thank you. Thank you, Mark.